welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good Wednesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 6th of May. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. You can do that with the National Weather Service at weather.gov slash Alaska. You can give us a call on the weather info line at 800-472-0391. Find us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube during the day. And of course, on uh, Facebook right now, you're seeing a lot of pictures from the Alaska Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management and the National Weather Service regarding Alaska River Watch. As we go through this period of, so far, a pretty slow and easy start with a lot of mush out taking place, uh, there may be some times of higher and elevated concern. You'll get those messages on Facebook, you'll get them on Twitter, and you'll get them uh, from the National Weather Service in the form of flood advisories, watches, or warnings. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. First, we want to remind you about a red flag warning due to higher winds across the Alaska Range. This is going to allow for a, a, an opportunity, if any fires start, to spread a little bit faster. So this red flag warning is in effect uh, through tonight and into uh, parts of tomorrow, perhaps for areas along the Deltana and Tananoff Flats, as well as the Alaska Range. That southerly wind is shaping up to be a little bit stronger uh, than usual, and as humidities remain low as a result of that, a fire danger is elevated. Now here's the breakup map for today. As of 3 o'clock today, no major concerns anywhere. You can see that most of the Yukon River is still listed as mostly ice. We have no new information to add to that. So if you have information and you're in one of these dots across the YK Delta, or perhaps you're a little bit further upstream, uh, so certainly let us know. You can do that easily on Twitter by using AK River Watch is your hashtag, or just give us a call there at the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center or talk to your uh, VPSO. Uh, many areas along the Kuskokwim are now at least some open. Some of those are mostly open and a few places upstream, especially as you head into the upper Kuskokwim Valley around McGrath, are completely open. So a lot of changes taking shape from south to north. You can see the Tanana River is at least mostly open to open and uh, certainly the Chena as well. As you get north of the Yukon, especially uh, areas there uh, from the Yukon Valley itself northward, things are still mostly ice and we have no new information really to pass on, but uh, things will be changing there as warmer air lifts northward over the coming days. So please, if you have observations, let us know what you're seeing on your part of the river. It helps everybody downstream and upstream of your village. So thank you so much for doing your part. Here's a look at what's going on as far as the fire danger goes. As we already know, we have that red flag warning, but there's also other areas into the upper Kuskokwim Valley uh, that are north of the Alaska Range, also across the Matanuska Valley, and areas into the Copper River Basin that are still dealing with some at least higher than normal fire danger at this point. Same goes for areas around Haines and out toward Skagway. It's a pretty isolated area as far as the fire danger itself goes in your communities there, but it is something to be mindful of that uh, as conditions are fairly dry, especially in this time of the year for southeast, it's usually only about a week or two that you have to worry about. But we're there, and higher fire danger is upon you at this point, so be extra careful and fire-wise around your community if you're in those regions. Here's a look at the Bering Sea satellite picture now, and take a look at this weather pattern we're in. We have a very slow, drifting weather pattern across the Bering Sea. What does that mean for sea ice? Well, chances are it won't be the wind pushing the ice around out across the Bering right now. It's just going to be the ocean currents, and that natural progression of the water movement will allow any floating ice to gradually drift around out there across the Bering. As you look out to the west, you can see the next wave of low pressure out across the uh, western parts of the Bering and moving eastward across the Kamchatka Peninsula. As this tracks eastward, 
you'll see that gradually bring in a little bit more of the Pacific moisture and that southerly flow will start working up the western bearing. We'll start to see a better chance of precipitation across the central and western Aleutians and probably an increase of that wind as that gradually drives eastward. Take a look at the rest of Alaska. We've got a much stronger system across the Gulf. This is a little bit more well organized and for right now it's not really messing with southeast at all. Southeast has had beautiful weather. Looks like that trend will continue at least through tomorrow. And after that, things start to change for you a little bit more. And everything you're seeing in the middle Tanana Valley around Fairbanks, beautiful weather there last weekend and all the way out toward the Seward Peninsula, all of that will start to fill in with clouds as we go ahead into the next week. Here's that circulation as that tracks northward. You can already see clouds building up over Kodiak. Rain showers expected there soon in south central. Waves of precipitation working their way northward. Already some of that creeping into uh, Matanuska and the uh, Susitna Valleys and the Kenai Peninsula and Prince William Sound. Out across the west, a lot of that's been breaking up across the southern Bering Sea on the more northerly flow side of the system. You can see the air circulating here from north to south. Uh, and all this cloud cover is building up over pretty dry air. So we're not going to have a lot of precipitation making itself uh, known northward as much as what we'll see across some of the more coastal communities. Like I said, southeast you're doing fine. You've got high pressure, uh, large and in charge, right across the southeastern panhandle this afternoon. A beautiful day there with temperatures back in the 50s and 60s. A front sitting out across the central Bering Sea draped over the Kodiak Island region and the north of Bristol Bay is sitting tight right now, but it's gradually going to fall apart over the next several hours, being replaced by the next wave working in from the south. Across the north, a trough of low pressure, a little bit of a disturbance there, and a wind shift, uh, keeping some of the coldest air up across the Arctic coast at this point. Some light snow reported across the north slope earlier today. Otherwise, fairly quiet weather in just about all corners of Alaska. Tonight's forecast does bring in an increasing threat for rain across the south central coastline. We've already seen waves of that working in from offshore during the afternoon today. A lot of that affecting Prince William Sound and some of that making into the Kenai Peninsula. Around Cook Inlet, a few showers there as well as southwestern Alaska looking at some light rainfall tonight. And then as you head west of Nunavak Island and the Pribilofs, a lot of that precipitation should really fall off pretty quickly. As you get into southeast, you may see a few more clouds drift in tonight, but it really looks like most of the precipitation is going to hold off just to the west. And going into Thursday, still you're protected by some of that very stable air across southeast. So that being the case, use your Thursday wisely and enjoy the sunshine as you can. Across the central and eastern Gulf, showers will line up there across uh, more of the southern waters. Already a southerly flow will bank in some of the moisture across the south central coastline in Prince William Sound, Kodiak Island, and down toward the Alaska Peninsula. North of Dillingham and into Bethel, a better chance for some rain as we head into Thursday. Low pressure sitting north of the Alaska Range, but south of the Yukon Valley. We'll keep winds and warmer temperatures working their way northward. Watch for those high temperature maps here in just a minute. You may uh, see a little bit of a sizzler coming your way. Most of the rainfall should stop on the south edge of the Alaska slopes, though. Out across the Bering and into eastern Asia, that low pressure is showing colder air is slowly drifting south and east. It doesn't look like it's going to be a big surge, but it does look like it's in motion and slowly heading toward the west coast. You can see making a little progress there on Friday. In the meantime, the pattern over the Gulf of Alaska really kind of throws on the brakes. We've got high pressure across British Columbia. That's feeding in warmer air coming in across the Gulf, grabbing moisture, sending that into south central in the Alaska Range. Southeast is still somewhat protected with that high pressure ridge close to home. But you can see the moisture starting to drop a little bit further south, maybe getting to Skagway and Haines and certainly Yakutat by the end of the week. But many, maybe even Juneau, southward to Sitka, Ketchikan, Annette, and uh, into the Dixon entrance communities there around uh, Klawak and Craig and even Hyder right now look fairly dry for Friday. So good news for you, more clouds than anything else. There's that next system though we saw moving in across from Eastern Asia, that's down to 998 millibars. But right in the middle of these two systems is a ridge of high pressure that's really gonna slow that down. So you're not gonna see a really fast progression of this zipping across uh, the Aleutians or the South Pacific coastline at this point. Northward, a few snow showers there around the uh, Brooks Range, probably from Arctic Village, and mainly westward along the north slopes. But south of that, it quickly becomes warm enough for anything to be rain, especially in the lower terrain. So again, not really expecting a whole lot of cold weather, certainly not expecting a whole lot of precipitation across the interior. A much better threat for some rainy days coming our way across the southern coastlines. Now, as far as temperatures go today, 40s and 50s for most of southeast. Uh, many locations just nudged right up on that 60 degree mark. Uh, we saw that around Ketchikan and Annette today, 59 in Sitka, 56 around Haines, a little bit cooler for around Skagway. 
around Prince William Sound, lower 50s there, Anchorage 53, 51 in Homer, 50 in Seward, 60 for Talkeetna, just shy of 60 by late afternoon around Fairbanks, 57 in Eagle, still a little bit of ice there along the banks, at least as we hear it, 55 in Fort Yukon, it was 39 in Anaktuvik Pass, and then we saw teens and 20s for the Arctic Coast. Kotzebue Sound temperatures were in the teens and 20s as well, uh, Kivalina showing 26, it was uh, 39 in Nome, 42 around Unalakleet, 60 in Galena. A very mild day there. And uh, for areas along the Kuskokwim Valley, lower to mid 50s there. McGrath was even 61 today with Tanana, just a little bit cooler there at 60. For Bristol Bay, we saw temps in the 40s and 50s. King Salmon made it to 51. Kodiak Island was in the lower to mid 40s. 40s and 50s for the Alaska Peninsula, and it was 45 in Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. Mid 40s for St. Paul and St. George and temperatures were a little bit cooler as you headed out into the western and central chain. Now, overnight lows will stay in the 30s and 40s for southeast, lower 40s for south central, 41 in Kodiak Island, mid 30s around the, the middle Tanana Valley, and northward into the teens and 20s we go for the Brooks Range and the Arctic Coast. Nome's looking at 31. Southwest generally around 40 degrees, Bristol Bay included 33 in St. Paul with high temperatures tomorrow back in the lower 40s for Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. Upper 40s for the Alaska Peninsula. Southwest, uh, once you get inland, temperatures skyrocket back into the upper 40s and 50s you go. 60 in McGrath, lower to mid 60s for the interior and many along the Arctic coast back in the mid to upper 20s, 30 in Kaktovik even. Uh, southeast, you're looking at temperatures at or just below that 60 degree mark. So again, enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the heat while you have it. Uh, mid 50s there for South Central, most of the Kenai Peninsula at least above that 50 degree mark tomorrow, 48 in Kodiak. On to flying weather now. You'll see MVFR conditions for most of the Arctic coast. <clears throat> uh, most areas south of the Bering are looking at IFR, probably west of St. Lawrence Island and then south of Nunavak Island and also around uh, areas near uh, Bristol Bay. <coughs> Excuse me. And many across the northern Gulf Coast are looking at IFR conditions south of the Kenai Peninsula, wrapping into the eastern Gulf too. But remember, most of southeast is under that ridge of high pressure, so things should be fairly nice there. And really, for most of the interior, flying obscured, uh, obstructions probably aren't going to be much of an issue there as far as the weather goes tomorrow, so things look pretty nice. Let's take a look at the pass conditions. Uh, northbound, no problem. Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass, things look VFR. Uh, through most of the day. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, we're going to say MVFR as most of that moisture is still working up across the eastern side of the Alaska Range. Western side, there's going to be some low clouds around as well, so watch for some issues there maybe in the western side. Rainy Pass, we're going to say VFR, and things look pretty good into Windy Pass and also Isabel Pass throughout the day, but showers will be developing and moving north as we go through your Thursday. Uh, for Mentasta Pass and on into Tanita Pass, things again still slowly changing. Mentasta is probably a good safe bet. Tanita, watch for some showers late in the day, but still looks like VFR. Portage Pass, things are changing there as more and more moisture makes it into the eastern side and the Prince William Sound side, and VFR conditions at least. And Chilkoot and White Pass, for now, things look pretty good. Looks like a nice day to fly in southeast. Freezing levels show that warm and wet air is really making itself known across Alaska. Look at all those higher freezing lines there, anywhere from 2,000 feet up around the Brooks Range, around two to 4,000 feet around the southern Chugach Range, and into southeast, six to 8,000 feet even over the Dixon entrance. We even have warmer air trying to make itself known across the southern Bering Sea. The surface freezing line also jumping northward, still hugging the ice edge out across the Bering, of course, but as far north as the Brooks Range. So really a lot of intrusion from that warmer air. Icing potential, just hit and miss stuff across southeast. Again, high pressure is really going to limit the amount of moisture over southeast, but anything you find close to the coast will be above 8,000 feet. A much better chance for some icing out across south and western Alaska and along the southern Gulf Coast. Our jet stream shows a pretty active pattern right now, but with one problem. There is a ridge of high pressure sitting out across the Gulf and extending all the way into the northern parts of Alaska. So while the activity in uh, this kind of a, a pattern would normally be the case, as long as we've got this doorstop sitting right here, nothing's kind of moving through the chute here. So we've got several potential areas of active weather, but nothing can really get through with a pattern like this. So we will sit and wait and see how this develops. In the meantime, we get back into our friend, the southerly flow that brings in the warm and wet air across southern coastal areas and maybe lets a little bit of the slop over the Alaska range there. So drier conditions and slightly faster moving winds just north of the range for now. A ridge of high pressure slowing the winds down from most of southeast. We have a little faster flow out over the coast. As you get out across the west, uh, look for more of a north and westerly flow coming over the central and eastern chain. 
and a weak trough there approaches from uh, eastern Asia moving into the Bering Strait. Winds and all in all pretty light there coming in from the north and west 15 to 20 miles an hour. More of a southerly flow across the Gulf. Very light winds across the interior. Slightly faster flow across the eastern Gulf. As high as 40 knots there at 3,000 feet. All in all, uh, same story as it was earlier this week and last week. Not a whole lot of change there. Turbulence potential. We'll watch for some faster moving breezes up across the eastern Beaufort, around Prince William Sound and across the Alaska Peninsula, generally due to some gap and valley winds there. But other than that, below two to 4,000 feet should just about do the trick. Everything else is offshore. So enjoy your flying weather tomorrow. Be safe and file a plan. We'll be back in just a few minutes with a look at your marine weather. Stay tuned. A flood mitigation plan can help communities identify measures that can be taken to reduce damage to property and risk to life caused by flooding. Well, this, this anchor for the, uh, the boardwalks, we got an anchor about every 20 feet on both sides. <clears throat> so if the water comes up, don't uh, move the boardwalks around. Before we got these anchors down, we had uh, boardwalks maybe about 10 feet off, off the current after the flooding went down. The cable's just like a harpoon tip. You drive it down and pull it and it's wet, wet itself, locked. We had this for a couple of years now. Last year we, we didn't have no problem with boardwalk repair. Every community is different because of its history, people, geography, weather, and location. All of these factors can be a cause for flooding or a benefit that guards against flooding. Those chunks were really big around here, too. We had water clear up to the steps up here. We saw it land. Communities need to know their flood history and to also understand that while past history is very important in predicting a flood, it is no guarantee because weather patterns are constantly changing and places that never flooded in recent memory might flood today. They need to identify the flood-prone areas of their village. With this knowledge, good decisions about site locations for new buildings or moving old buildings can be made. You were here when the flood when it flooded so bad you were up to that marker. Has, has anybody talked about moving the uh, post office? I wouldn't mind if it's moved. I think uh, this is a bad place for it with uh, flood every year. It doesn't always come up, but I think it'd be, it would be better if it was up in a higher place. 89, we had a flood. This was what happened during the flood. Uh, it was a good spot down here. I, didn't, I wasn't worried about any flood. I didn't think we would have it. Built my house back in a little higher ground. And, you, know, this was the, uh, you think you'll have problems with flooding in your new house? Uh, I don't think so. I hope not. It's a little higher than where this one is. It's pretty sad to lo lose your house, but can't do anything about it, I guess. But not all buildings can be moved to safe ground. In these instances, communities can take other measures, such as flood control projects, seeking assistance from state and federal agencies, flood insurance programs, flood alert systems, public awareness and preparation programs, and learning the benefits of land use regulations. There is also the reality that many villages are located in floodplains where flooding occurs yearly. However, serious damage can be avoided if structures are built out of the floodway. Floodproofing buildings will minimize damage even in floodplains. This can be done by elevating living spaces above flood levels and good soil drainage. If structures have to be built in floodplains, then access routes to higher ground are essential. Other factors that need to be considered are erosion, wave action, and drainage impacts. If buildings are elevated in floodplains, utility pipes, electrical connections, water and sewer lines, and fuel and propane tanks also need to be floodproofed according to code. To enforce sound building practices in floodplain areas, 
it is a good idea to require development permits from individuals and even government agencies. Decisions that are made by others outside the community, even government agencies, should be filtered through the collective wisdom, knowledge, and life experience of the people who live on the river. One way to ensure good decisions and good development of your community is to learn all you can about your river, your history, and where you live. My little nephew, Chucky, he come home for a week. He was disgusted with that school teacher. We cannot get that teacher to put things up. Well, this is what they're used to doing every spring. It's a precaution that everybody takes. And the school teacher is pretty new, and he said, oh, you kids don't know what you're talking about. And about, oh, I don't know, about midnight, that water started coming in, and I mean, it came in in a hurry. Well, the poor school teacher, he had to roll up to the store and got his uh, wife and his two boys out. And so he got out. Next day we came down and we walked around and he was out there. Oh man, I tell you what a mess he had. Everything was wet in his house. These little kids came along and my nephew and his little buddies. And Mr. Rasmussen, you should have listened to us old timers. <laughs> <laughs> we should get a name. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rasmussen was quite disgusted cussing under his breath and my brother and I we laughed so much over that <laughs> but everybody knows every spring you have to be prepared Time for a quick check of the sea ice edge. You can always find this at weather.gov slash anchorage. Just look for a sea ice desk on the left-hand side of your screen when you get there. You'll notice there's still some, at least some low to medium concentration ice across areas south of St. Matthew, though there's a little bit of open water just south of the island itself, up into the Bering Strait and just off the YK coastline. But out of the Gulf of Anadir and southwest of St. Lawrence Island, there's considerable amounts of mostly open water there. So a lot of changes. And again, most of the ice that's moving around won't be because of the wind currents, but probably because of the ocean currents as we go into the next several days, thanks to very light flow out there. Now across southeast, look for winds from the south and southwest across the inner waterways. Winds will be light, seas will be pretty small, only two feet there as we head into Thursday. Southeasterly is coming up the outer coast, 20 to 30 miles per hour with seven to nine foot seas the further north you go. Now on Friday, winds will pick up a little bit on the inside, about 10 to 15 knots. Seas still running around two to three feet. Across the outer coast, not much of a change. 25 to 30 knots with seas from 8 feet outside of the Dixon entrance to as high as 11 feet outside of Yakutat. For south central, look for a northeast flow coming down Cook Inlet, 20 to 25 knots. A little bit more of a westerly turn as you get west of the Barren Islands with southerlies 15 to 20 across Kodiak Island. Seas only 3 feet inside of Shelikoff Strait though. And inside Prince William Sound, a little bit of a different story. Winds will be as strong as 30 knots there from the east with a 7 foot sea. And winds not as strong outside into the northern Gulf, but sea should be as high as 11 feet for Thursday. Winds will come down just a little bit on Friday inside of Prince William Sound. Seas down to 6 feet. Look for a north and easterly flow on either side of Kodiak Island. 15 to 20 knots in the north, 25 knots a little bit further south and outside of Resurrection Bay. And winds turn to the north and northwest across Kodiak Island. 20 to 25 knots with 7 foot seas on the eastern side of Kodiak Island. For Thursday, low pressures working across the Alaska Peninsula. Look for easterlies in Bristol Bay. Northwesterlies from Cold Bay to King Cove and Sand Point, 20 knots there with 5 to 6 foot seas. And southerlies from Castle Cape west to Chignik at 20 knots. As we get into Friday, a little bit of a shift, but generally a north and westerly flow will be maintained for the Alaska Peninsula Friday. A westerly flow inside of Bristol Bay and northerlies on the Pacific Coast, 20 knots with a 5 to 6 foot sea.
For the Marines on Thursday, we see north and westerly winds from the central and eastern chain. A little bit more of a southwesterly flow south of Nikolsky to Atka. It's be 15 knot wind and 3 foot seas there. Pretty light winds as you head out toward Kiska and Attu. Only 10 knots there with a 4 foot sea. Otherwise, northwesterlies around Unalaska, Dutch Harbor, and on the Bering and Pacific Sea coast side, 20 knots with a 4 to 6 foot sea. That shifts to more of a westerly flow on Friday. And you can see the return of the south and easterly winds from Atka to Adak, Kiska, and Shemya. 15 to 20 knots, even 30 knots there, in fact, south of Adak and Atka with uh, seas running around 8 feet or so. We'll see a more of a west and southwesterly flow for the central and eastern chain at 15 to 20 knots on Friday. Light northerly is coming down out of the Bering Strait with variable flow west of Hooper Bay and a very light wind in the Kuskokwim Bay, only about 10 to 15 knots or so. And pretty small seas around the Priblavs with a northwesterly wind at 15 knots, 3 foot seas expected there. For Friday, north and westerly winds coming in across the western coast, 15 to 20 knots, seas still 1 to 3 feet. A southwest flow around St. Matthew at 20 knots and westerlies coming into the Priblavs at 15 knots with a 3 foot sea. Now for the north slope and east and southeasterly flow for the Beaufort Sea Coast, 15 to 20 knots from Barrow down toward Point Lay coming in from the west and southwest. Southeasterly still coming across Barrow though at 20 knots and light northerly flow inside of Kotzebue Sound at 10 knots. That'll pick up a little bit more on Friday to 15 knots, but just up the coast winds remain pretty light around the Chukchi Sea Coast, only 5 to 10 knots there. And an east and northeasterly wind coming into Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse and Kaktovik only about 5 to 10 knots for Friday. Recapping tonight's weather, there's a much better chance for some light rainfall across the south central coastline, Prince William Sound and south and west into Kodiak Island and southwestern Alaska. It's still cold enough for some areas across the central Bering to pick up a few snow showers, but most likely if you see precipitation in Alaska today, it's going to be liquid rainfall. Now, as you get out in the southeast, things are still pretty dry. You'll see some clouds move in from time to time, but dry weather should persist at least for most areas through tomorrow. Clouds will continue to increase northward and north of the Yukon Valley. By the end of the week, you'll have a chance for at least a little bit of snow around the Brooks Range and mostly rainfall along the Yukon Valley and more rain for south central. Thanks for watching. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1 800 WX Brief for a formal pre flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Cook Inlet, Tug and Barge, a marine transportation company specializing in harbor services focusing on the Port of Anchorage and the major commercial participants in the Cook Inlet region, providing customers with marine services specifically tailored to their needs.